Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to we're going to start. Okay. So um, it's been a really interesting three days. Uh, four for some who came for the day zero, as we called it, and um, we're we finally reached the closing. Plenary. So those of you with the stamina to have got to this point, well done. Um, so um, I, th I think most of you probably know me by now. Simon Lund from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and the South African Medical Research Council, and I'll be co-chairing the session with Shamila. Would you like to? I think everyone I've engaged with well a few people already. So it's Shamila Souza. I'm associate researcher at the Fiocruz Brasilia. And we are very happy that there's still many of you here to follow up this closing ceremony with us. Thank you. So our um, first and really pleasant task is to um, announce the three people who had the best posters on display at the symposium. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, Marcella and Mariana to join us on the stage to announce the poster um, winners and also the three individuals who are going to give um, short presentations on their posters. So please come up to the stage now. Okay, so I want to say that was our work to make the assessment of the posters. We think that all the posters were very amazing, very interesting jobs. Uh, the posters in a very good quality, so the job was very hard. Uh, if someone doesn't, uh, didn't have the opportunity to see the posters, you have the posters are still in the in the area of the coffee. But the works are going to be published in the um, uh, web from the CAS Symposium, so you can read the posters because they are very interesting. Yeah. And it was a challenge to uh, assess them and give them some notes. <laughs> so I have to say that none was really uh, worse than the others. No, the, the scores were very uh, similar, but then we have the three best <laughs> scores. So um, let's start with the first. Yeah. yeah. This is the, but I cannot read it. <laughs> yeah. The f Sorry? Sorry? Oh, thank you. Ah, but then I can no. Have you read it away? Yeah. So, the first one is from Anna, and then th this is a challenge, Shram, Shram, <laughs> okay, with the paper, with the poster, um, Avaliação de Impacto à Saúde na Cidade como Ferramenta para Alcançar os Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Foi muito bem colocado. So Bay Marie Schmidt had this poster, a very nice poster about the national stakeholders' perception and experiences of the role, generation, and use of evidence in clinical practice guideline development in South Africa. So congratulations. And the third 
um, evidência qualitativa, estudo de los de... No, you should read yes, this. Yes, yes. Carolina, <laughs> from Costa Rica, so my friend. Evidência qualitativa, estudo de los determinantes sociales de la salud para el abordaje de la obesidad. No hay conflicto de interés. No la conocí antes de calificar el post. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say that it, the three of them were most, the most... Uh, beautiful, I think, that the, the best presentations for me, I think that they presented in a very nice and clear way, but with figures and this thing, so it was, congratulations. The first one to present it. Anna? Yeah. Posso começar? Opa. Hello? <laughs> Boa tarde, meu nome é Ana, eu sou aqui de Brasília. Alô? Ah, tá rolando. É, sim. Onde eu aperto? Ah, tá. Bom, é, eu estou aqui hoje para apresentar uma parte da minha pesquisa de doutorado, que eu estou fazendo na Escola Nacional de Saúde Pública, da Fiocruz, do Rio de Janeiro. É, no programa de Saúde Pública e Meio Ambiente, e eu sou orientada pela professora Sandra Reikon. Bom, é, a minha pesquisa de doutorado é uma avaliação de impacto à saúde é, na implementação e criação de uma área protegida urbana aqui na cidade de Sobradinho, no Distrito Federal. E eu começo perguntando, com uma pergunta de pesquisa, assim, quais são os impactos à saúde de uma área protegida urbana? ela pode ter impactos positivos e negativos. Né? Os impactos positivos estão muito presentes na, na literatura, como serviços ecossistêmicos, salutogênicos, é, regulação térmica, modulação de doenças, preservação de valores históricos, culturais, além de geração de oportunidades econômicas e educativas. Mas quando essas áreas são abandonadas pelo poder público, elas geram impactos negativos, né? que devido à degradação ambiental e ao processo de urbanização, é, vem várias doenças de vetores, é, doenças transmitidas por veiculação hídrica, estresse psicossocial, violência, o um aumento das doenças crônicas não transmissíveis, especulação mobiliária, enfim, que acabam sobrecarregando os serviços de saúde e, por consequência, a economia. E aí eu venho com uma hipótese de que uma avaliação de impacto à saúde com a participação da sociedade feita antes da implementação dessa área, ela pode identificar os impactos positivos e os negativos, podendo mitigar esses impactos negativos atuais do território e potencializar os positivos daqueles que virão quando a área for implementada. Então, o objetivo da pesquisa que eu apresentei aqui é construir um modelo de avaliação de impacto à saúde de uma área protegida urbana, através do desenvolvimento de uma abordagem participativa, considerando os objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável. Aqui é um mapa com o campo da minha pesquisa. Ela está no Distrito Federal, entre duas cidades é, daqui, Sobradinho, Sobradinho 2, um, duas cidades é, economicamente, socialmente vulneráveis, em expansão, e que são permeadas por várias áreas protegidas, como unidade de conservação, o rio, que é o Ribeirão Sobradinho, e outros parques que nunca saíram do papel. E, ao longo dos últimos quatro anos, a rede de atores locais vem se organizando e lutando para tentar implementar esses parques. Há dois anos atrás, a gente conseguiu colocar na agenda do governo uma proposta de um mosaico de unidades de conservação do Ribeirão Sobradinho, que iria interligar todas as nascentes desse parque, formando uma nova unidade integrada. E a gente está esperando um diagnóstico ambiental que vai subsidiar a política de criação desse parque. Mas, enquanto isso, a nossa proposta é que a comunidade, ou seja, as comunidades locais, façam o seu diagnóstico. E elas que levantem quais são as demandas por território, com foco, um enfoque na saúde. Né? E aí, a metodolo... aqui tem uma foto da rede de atores, algumas ações que a gente fez ao longo desses anos. Enfim... Vou passar rápido, porque ninguém está controlando o tempo, mas acho que está tranquilo, né? Tá. Então, a metodologia é a pesquisação, e eu, eu sigo um modelo de avaliação de impacto à saúde da Organização Mundial da Saúde, mas a diferença é que eu vou colocar a rede de atores locais, formado por atores sociais, institucionais, representantes das comunidades locais, 
eles é que vão coordenar, vão escolher os, os instrumentos de pesquisa, os objetivos e iriam acompanhar todo o processo. É, tem aqui explicado quais as atividades, mas eu não vou detalhar elas. Mas o importante é que a gente agora, no momento, está buscando recurso de compensação ambiental para poder é, tocar a pesquisa de forma que a gente consiga incluir outros atores, dando bolsas de extensão para graduação, alunos do ensino médio e para a comunidade. É, eu espero, com essa pesquisa, construir indicadores de ODS, com né, uma construção participativa, novas abordagens e ferramentas para o uso de evidências qualitativas, qualificação da participação da comunidade na gestão do território, fortalecimento de instituições públicas e privadas, ações intersetoriais para a promoção da saúde e alcance dos ODSs. E como reflexão, pensando aqui no espaço que a gente está, no como que os ODSs podem, como essa minha ferramenta pode é, ajudar na, no alcance dos objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável, eu, eu chego a considerar que a avaliação de impacto à saúde nas cidades é uma excelente ferramenta para tomada de decisão, implementação e monitoramento dos ODSs, pois ela atua de forma transdisciplinar nos 17 ODSs e constrói instrumentos para implementar políticas baseadas em evidências científicas. Outro pensamento que eu tenho é que a AIS ela é um processo que apoia o uso de evidências qualitativas na tomada de decisão pois ela utiliza métodos participativos para incluir os interesses e demandas dos atores envolvidos. E uma última reflexão, que é a pesquisação, ela traz evidências qualitativas que geram impacto imediato no processo de desenvolvimento da avaliação de impacto à saúde. É, obrigada, e aqui tem uma foto do parque e desses atores que precisam ser incluídos no parque, que hoje é abandonado porque eu acredito que os atores se apropriam do território, é a melhor forma de implementar as políticas. E eu acho que todo esse processo ele, ele vai ajudar a comunidade a ganhar capacidade de lutar por outras tantas lutas que tem para sua saúde e qualidade de vida. Obrigada. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Bima Reshmet. I work at Cochrane South Africa at the South African Medical Research Council. So I will be giving you a brief uh, overview of um, the SAGE project. It stands for the South African Guidelines Excellence Project. It was a flagship project funded by the SAMRC. And um, this project had three different stages um, in which the goals of the project, uh, of project were fulfilled. Um, the first stage of the project um, involved mapping um, guideline stakeholders in South Africa and also um, identifying what kind of um, area of work um, they are doing, um, as well as identifying um, primary health care um, guideline um, guidelines that are available in South Africa and whether those were useful or not. Um, and then thirdly, we also tried to identify um, guideline stakeholders' needs. So this first stage then led to the development of a toolkit, um, which basically um, helped to support um, guideline stakeholders with writing guidelines as well as implementing them. Um, and then there were also a lot of capacity building activities um, related to, um, for example, postgraduate training programs, um, um, training uh, the guideline stakeholders um, and other activities. So, um, looks weird, okay? But uh, so this was a primary qualitative um, study, including um, interviews and focus groups. Um, and uh, the main participants were clinical uh, practice guideline developers, users, and implementers, both at the provincial and national level. Oops, yeah. um, so the first poster um, is um, basically um, around, so this is um, the poster that I, I think was awarded. It's um, national stakeholders' perceptions and experiences of the role gener generation and use of evidence in clinical practice guideline development in South Africa. And what we really wanted to highlight through this poster was the dual role that um, guideline, um, clinical practice guideline developers play in South Africa. So they often have to generate the evidence themselves and then use it to make decisions about guidelines. 
Um, they experienced several challenges related to um, the complex um, and iterative processes of getting evidence and using that evidence. Um, they also spoke about their own lack of skill sets, um, but also the um, unequal distribution of skills across provinces in South Africa. Um, and also um, about the fact that they didn't have a common language um, to talk about evidence or to talk about the methods of, of evidence. So they made two recommendations. Um, for the short term, they recommended training and standardizing approaches um, for using evidence in um, uh, guideline development. But then they also uh, made a long-term recommendation, um, which was really important um, um, to highlight, which is to establish an evidence synthesis and coordination unit to support um, these processes. Then um, with the second poster, um, we wanted to um, highlight specifically um, um, gaps in the um, CPG pr um, development processes um, for national primary care CPG developers working um, not only within government but also in other public sectors and the private sector. So um, the, the first gap was that there was an, uh, um, a lack of systematic use of evidence. Um, and also in terms of um, stakeholder consultation, so these guideline processes weren't really systematic in how they um, uh, consulted um, the guideline users. Um, there was also a lack of transparency about how actually evidence was used and what the actual guideline development process looked like. Um, and then there were lots of um, panelists or guideline developers who had lots of personal, intellectual, and financial conflicts of interests um, but these were not declared or managed, and there were no processes for doing so. Um, and then second to last, um, there was also a need for enhanced communication and um, co-production between guideline development groups and also between public and private sectors. Um, and then lastly, there weren't really clear processes in terms of how to um, put contextual evidence um, into the guideline development process. Thank you, and I would just like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors and all the institutions that they're affiliated with. Um, I've also added ref uh, resources to the SAGE website as well as the toolkit that was um, um, developed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carolina, and here I'm presenting a poster we've been working on for the last years. Uh, our team is basically multidisciplinary. Um, we have anthropologists, health promotion professionals, epidemiologists. So um, it's about the social determinants of health in an obesity prevention strategy. And what I'm going to show you today is a qualitative approach that we took uh, to analyze our data. So uh, our main objective was to identify, identify the interventions that we should work on to act upon the structural determinants of health. And this is made in order to work on a health promotion strategy that is targeted to women in urban settings in Costa Rica. And it is targeted to women aged 25 to 45, and they are basically mothers. And the reason why we chose mothers is because they usually replicate uh, habits and models for their entire families. So we didn't have funding to work on the entire life cycle populations, then we chose uh, women. So uh, this is a background of, let's see, Costa Rica has universal health care, and then most of the problems actually come from inequity. So um, there are high prevalence rates of, of, of obesity, and obesity affects mainly women, and among women it affects mainly those in low socioeconomic status. So, and this does not happen only in Costa Rica, but in Latin America and the world as well. So um, 
Overweight and obesity are actually very important risk factors to act upon since they are uh, risk factors for a number of chronic diseases. So uh, what we wanted to do was to work on a health promotion strategy so that we can act on decreasing prevalence of obesity rates in urban Costa Rican women. This is a phenomeno phenomenological study and we collected, collected information through semi-structural interviews and this part of the research, we worked on interviews to local government officials. We chose two counties of the country where um, they, they are especially unequal in terms of socioeconomic positions of the population. They share border, but one of them is one of the richest counties in the country, and the other one is one of the poorest counties. Uh, we used um, an instrument that included those five components you can see here. We had the social and political context. We had the institutional actions to prevent obesity, but at the community level. We had food environment and food preferences for women. And then we had the fourth one, physical environmental conditions that support or hide their physical activity. And finally, we had some questions about the healthcare system. Our main results can be summarized in these uh, slides. Uh, women's preferences regarding places to purchase food and their food preferences actually varied by socioeconomic status. Women who lived in, in the highest socioeconomic position county used to have uh, a very good access to, to food and to healthy food as compared to women living in the lowest socioeconomic position. Um, government officials perceive that poverty limits women access to existing community resources that are related to obesity prevention. And something that looks like the most important finding to me is that women actually avoid physical activity in public spaces because of safety concerns. And this happened in all of the three socioeconomic studies we studied, but especially among the low socioeconomic women who are actually who have the, the poorest health outcomes in terms of overweight and obesity. And the other um, finding has to do with how government officials do not seem themselves like the uh, officials who have to work on uh, obesity prevention. Uh, most of officials think that it's a, a job that must be done by the Ministry of Health when it actually has to do in a shared way by all the, the government officials. Um, we um, can conclude from this study that the use of qualitative evidence actually allowed us for a deeper understanding of how these structural determinants influence the prevalence of overweight and obesity. And this is an input that we have used for a health promotion strategy that we already um, write, we already wrote, but we are working on the implementation of the strategy. And uh, definitely we think that overweight, overweight and obesity prevention will contribute to the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals in Costa Rica. Thank you. So thank you very much to the presenters and I think that we need to continue with the program. No, yeah. Simon? Thank you very much and thank you and congratulations again.
So thank you very much for those really interesting presentations. Um, I'd li like to invite Megan Boren, who's going to give us some feedback from um, a couple of the satellite sessions that are happening elsewhere. Hi, everyone. Um, so you might have heard that we were taking questions um, throughout the previous three days from people in our virtual um, platform. So there are people who are joining us live um, from many places around the world. And there are also some more organized sessions um, in several different um, locations. So we're just going to share a couple of reflections from um, some of these satellite sessions. So the first one was at the National University of Ireland in uh, Galway. And here, um, this was a group um, who's working on integrating qualitative evidence um, into trial design um, and evaluation. And so they were running a full day session. You can see a photo of some of the um, participants there. And as part of their, um, their program, they were watching and joining us live um, in some of the broadcasts, as well as talking about how they can um, better use qualitative evidence when they're um, working on the uh, trial context. Another one, we might not be surprised that there are people joining us from uh, Norway, given our lovely organizers. Um, but Heather Ames organized um, a session that was attended um, by many people at the Norwegian Institute of Health in Oslo. And here they were bringing together um, uh, groups from um, mainly the government, um, from many different sectors within the government, including um, drug abuse, alcohol use, um, and public health uh, more broadly. And so they were running um, several sessions, joining us live, as well as reflecting on how they can um, better systematically answer questions about acceptability, experiences, preferences, and feasibility in their own work um, within the government. So it was really lovely. Thank you to everyone in the um, virtual platform for joining us, and to those who are um, hosting the satellite sessions around the world. Great. Just so that we don't get lost in translation, I see that everyone here is not using the radio for simultaneous translation <laughs> for Portuguese. I'll do this in English to save time. Um, now we have a few reflections on the symposium, and we invited three very interesting people that participated in our event. Um, to share a bit of their thoughts on what they have heard here and what are the key issues that we can take together forward as a community together that we brought here at the Key Symposium. So I would like to invite Laura Boeda, Gloria Carmona and Kingsley Perico for you guys to join us here so that we can share a little bit of what you thought was interesting from these days. Hi to you all. Uh, I'm Laura from Brazil, and I like to start talking uh, with you and asking for a round of applause to Sharmila, George, Simon, and Claire, and everyone here at Fiocruz who works so so hard to welcome us and and do this great symposium. That's not one symposium; is like. 22 symposiums at the same time, uh, so many interesting subjects, so if we could give them a hand and an applause, that would be great. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, they asked me to talk very briefly about the symposium that I did attend, and <laughs> My symposium was full of very interesting conversation with civil society organizations and how they can work on uh, bringing qualitative data to policy making, especially uh, concerning human rights topics. Uh, when we think about the SDGs, human rights is such a transversal topic that touches all of our lives, all of our diverse countries. So uh, civil society organizations from uh, Brazil and different parts of the world are very much engaged in bringing qualitative data 
concerning human rights, to uh, foster better policies, to monitor the SDGs. Um, uh, we do actually have a, a Brazilian report uh, provided by a working group here who, who is all made uh, of civil society organizations. That is the only report Brazil is actually doing today on monitoring the SDGs. It's uh, open in the internet in English, so I can share in the platform with you. Uh, I also was part of a very interesting proposal here at the, the symposium. Me, Tatiana, and Tamara were facilitating the open spaces. And after the open spaces, we ask whomever participated to uh, think of a word that summoned uh, what their experience was. And we got three words. The first word was hope. The second word was collaboration. And the third word was dialogue. And I guess this summons up very much uh, this experience of meeting new people, sharing experiences. So th this has been really a great, uh, great way to, to summon whatever we experience here. And uh, Simon also asked me to talk about going forward. Uh, what do, do I, I perceive as a path? And um, one of the things that the all the sessions I've been part of were talking about is the importance of collaborating uh, civil society organizations, researchers, and whenever possible, governments uh, to really get the best of our abilities and work in a common project. So there's an, a lot of knowledge, qualitative evidence uh, being uh, produced in, the, in all these sectors. So we really have to unite forces. And uh, a great concern, especially in the human rights front, that our governments are lacking transparency and open data. So especially researchers and the civil society to join hands and work to, to make the voices of people heard, better understand how the policies and the SDGs are actually being experienced in the territories. Uh, and this is a, a great challenge, but uh, as one of the words of the open spaces tell us, we, we have to, to keep hoping and working together. So that's my message for today. Thank you so much. It was really special to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, for the invitation to, provide, to give some words. The first thing that I have to say, thank you. Thank you for all the organizers, for the few crews. Um, it was amazing to be here. I have to attend those two issues. The first one is, I'm going to provide my view. Uh, for me, this was a really valuable experience because this I have the opportunity to, to share the, the experience the, that we have. I have the opportunity to, to, to refine, to, to have a feedback. We, in my place, we follow several methodologies that we identify from some of you. So I finally got a feedback about them. And I got several ideas, methodologies that, that you share with us. And you should be sure that I'm bringing this with me and I will put in in my Peruvian table. So what I what I think that are the next uh, steps, I think that we need to improve our capacity to, to share, to, to build networks. I mean, uh, to start to think not just as researchers, we need to do, start to think like community things, and we need to have a, a perspective about them, not just as research participants. And we need to understand better uh, the profile of the decision makers. Uh, I know that we have several political situations that are very controversial, but, but they have an important role too. So we need to be, I mean, we don't have to expect that they are going to understand us. We need to understand their process 
and in order to that understanding to try to improve their current strategy. So for that, it is necessary to to make to build networks between us. No, now we know that we are not alone in this uh, qualitative process or in the strategies for improve knowledge into practice. So I believe that we need to build bridge between us and that we need to share our experience, our good and bad experience because we learn from both of them. So we don't need, don't need to be fair to say it was I fail in this because just when people fail and recognize a fail, the, pe the, the person have the chance to, to evolve. And I'm very happy to be here. I love Brazil because I made my master, degree, my master degree here in Brazil. Brazil is very special for me. And thank you very much because you were amazing. We learned a lot from everyone. Thank you. OK. Um, good evening. I would like to thank uh, the organizers on behalf of my team. Um, as a custom of PHM, we always want to gather people's voices and amplify it. And to do that is uh, Mr. Ravi and uh, Linda to join me, uh, put together uh, the issues that we have gathered from this conference to be made to you, known to you. Contributions to QE outcome, statement from PHM and participants from the session on narratives and counter narratives on health policy making in Africa. Values of citizens' voices through qualitative discourse. Considerations to ensure use of QE, that is qualitative evidence in influencing the narratives on policy making. Already we know that qualitative evidence is a powerful tool to influence policy making and the narratives on policy making. It can identify gaps and can show multiple perspectives to challenge the, determinant, the dominant narrative that does not represent a universal truth. The following issues are important to consider in ensuring changes in these narratives. How do we deliver qualitative evidence? There are different formats of how we deliver evidence so as to pose it to the right people at the right time and in the right form. Qualitative evidence allows us to draw on rigorous methods and to generate informational constructs that carry scientific weight. Further, when we use stories, short films, or poems, or whatever the format may be in a qualitative version, we introduce the evidence to a broader audience, including the wider public. There is value in the story that enhances data as it evokes empathy and responsiveness to data. To whom do we deliver the qualitative evidence? Choosing the right audience when communicating qualitative evidence is a very important step. The current strategy has been business as usual, targeting influential people in government. However, there is a greater louder voices that push for change that are untapped. Drawing in civil society and other actors who are passionate about qualitative evidence in decision making will be a useful strategy. Who is pushing the message? Qualitative evidence can be more readily accepted because the narrative of the data embodies human perspective and emotions. We strong with strong values in finding public figures who can champion specific qualitative findings as a means towards enhancing the use of qualitative evidence. When do we deliver qualitative evidence? From our experience, qualitative evidence can be more persuasive to a broader audience, including policymakers, technocrats, and the people. Varied opportunities exist more so now that we have varied platforms and forums that seems to monitor progress and support innovative approaches of achieving global targets. There is the need to leverage on these potentials by supporting and promoting discourse, 
with qualitative evidence. For example, where big changes are to occur, considering this course on insurance of South Africa and currently Kenya, and many other discourse around the world on many evidences. Linda would tell us about the relative strengths. Hello, everyone. I'm Linda Shiro from the People's Health Movement, and I'm based in South Africa. As part of the outcomes of our parallel session, we really looked at the relative strengths of qualitative evidence in speaking truth to power. And we had two important things that came out of this, that qualitative evidence has the voice and the reason for the opinion of the voice. And this opinion has the relative strength as it's a snapshot of the citizens' voices rather than an interpretation by a researcher for effect. So people's stories, short films, has an opinion and it's a snapshot and can speak truth to power. The second thing is that when we are conceptualizing qualitative evidence, it's important to think about the purpose to which you're using the, audience or, um, the evidence. So we find that we've got a breadth of qualitative evidence available, and it's important to pick the right one to effect change. So the strength in it is that if you're trying to change a local policy, you may choose from a set of constructs around multiple perspectives rather than a quote. But if you're trying to influence a colleague or a funder, maybe a quote is just the right thing at the right time. So it's important to think about the purpose of the qualitative evidence. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> I'm Ravi, also from the People's Health Movement. I'll talk just a short bit about the novel and alternative means that we've seen to apply qualitative evidence. Um, to do so, first, we must be creative. To apply qualitative evidence in novel domain areas, we need to be proactive about presenting the value of this sort of work and increase the visibility and credibility of qualitative forms of evidence. And we see value in bringing that evidence to areas where it's not been routinely used, such as policy change, humanitarian emergencies, or dis infectious disease outbreaks. The experience from Africa shows that qualitative evidence is not only effective, but also extremely efficient in rapidly changing contexts. And as a network of producers and users of evidence, we have to demonstrate the value and use of qualitative evidence, bringing together data in novel ways. There is already an existing African evidence network. And as we leave this qualitative evidence symposium, we have to expand on the use of that kind of evidence in those networks and others. So we are advocates for the use of qualitative indicators in the sustainable development goals. Qualitative evidence, however, has been omitted or even excluded from the SDG assessment framework. And that represents a large gap in measuring progress or failure in achieving the SDGs. To, we now need to identify those who may be left behind. And we have a collective responsibility to identify the value that qualitative evidence brings to the SDGs and to define the means for incorporating qualitative measures into the SDG indicator framework and advocate for the broad use of qualitative methods and evidence in assessing the SDGs. Given prevailing unaddressed gaps in the SDG m and framework and its current evidence base, evaluators and researchers with expertise in qualitative methods must step forward and present the case for qualitative evidence in the SDGs. In closing, we as evaluators, researchers, practitioners, and users of evidence recognize a unique value in qualitative evidence. This evidence speaks truth to power, not with numbers, but with humanity and emotion. In a world with unfulfilled aspirations for equality among people, the need to provide voices to the powerless, marginalized, left behind, or excluded is greater than ever. As individuals here in this first qualitative evidence symposium, we must take on the commitment to institutionalizing qualitative evidence as a co-equal statement of evidence alongside quantitative and other forms of evidence. This commitment goes beyond our specific individual roles in evaluation research or use of evidence, 
It means that we must extend this understanding as a service to our professions and to the people whose voices we aim to represent. And accordingly, we call for and look forward to a second Qualitative Evidence Symposium. And at that time, we hope to review evidence for the generation use of qualitative evidence itself with a view toward advancing this field. So, obrigado. Gracias. Thank you. Asante Nisana. So thanks very much for those thoughtful and rich reflections. And I think um, it very much reminds us of the power of qualitative research to humanize decision-making processes. So thank you for bringing us back to that and for your statement, which I hope we can s very soon put up on the Qualitative Evidence Symposium website. So thank you again. And thanks to Gloria and to Laura for sharing your reflections. Much appreciated. And I think these will inform our discussions in the next few minutes. So um, the um, last part of the um, closing session, the purpose was for us to have a discussion as a community about how we can strengthen capacity to demand, produce, and use qualitative evidence to inform decisions for the SDGs. And just to sort of um, put that in context, I thought I would share very briefly a couple of, a few reflections based on um, what I've heard here over the last few days, but also um, conversations that I've had in the corridor and in various other places. So some of you may see some of your ideas popping up on the screen. Thank you very much for sharing those. Um, we talked um, earlier about the ecosystem for qualitative evidence, where we have people producing primary qualitative evidence, evidence synthesizers, feeding information into those who produce in evidence-informed products like policy briefs, guidelines, and so on, uh, use of that evidence by decision-makers, which in turn um, may inform implementation by implementers in the field, and evaluation of that feeds back into that process. Um, but what we heard from Harsha and others is that that qualitative evidence ecosystem sits within a larger policy cycle um, for health or, or, or social care or whatever, um, part of the agenda we're looking at. And indeed, there are multiple policy cycles across sectors that are interacting with each other. Um, and this is a quite complex picture that we need to engage with in relation to the SDGs. So given this background, how can we mainstream qualitative evidence? So some of the points that were made over the last few days were firstly the need to institutionalize qualitative evidence. Um, by that, I think we meant to incorporate qualitative evidence into the frameworks that we use to analyze political health and social systems and to structure and package evidence to inform decision making so that we can systematically use synthesized qualitative evidence when policy windows are available. Secondly, engage. We need to engage with multiple levels of decision making from national to local, across different branches of government, administrative, judicial, and so on, and across different sectors involving a range of stakeholders. Network. We need to establish national cross-sectoral networks of qualitative evidence producers and packages or knowledge brokers and their decision-maker partners. And we need to link these networks across countries to share experiences and tools, strengthen capacity, mentor, and so on. And finally, culture shift. I think many of you alluded to the need to build a culture of using qualitative evidence to inform decision making, taking into account different cultures of evidence use across sectors and settings, and also different approaches to what constitutes qualitative evidence in different sectors. So in doing this, we may need to explore, firstly, standards and guidance, what guidance is needed to facilitate qualitative evidence use in different types of decision processes, what tools are available to support this. Secondly, we need to look at global and local. What approaches are available for combining the best synthesized global qualitative evidence and local qualitative evidence to inform decisions? 
collaborative models were discussed. How can we draw on different types of collaboration, co-production, co-creation models for producing evidence in response to policy needs? What are the implications of these for producing and using qualitative evidence? And finally, novel methods. How best do we use novel approaches such as video and storytelling to make the findings of qualitative studies and syntheses more accessible to stakeholders involved in decision-making processes? So of course this is not a comprehensive overview of the many interesting and rich discussions that we have, but I hope we can use that um, to continue our discussion now on how we might institutionalize the use, the demand use and production of qualitative evidence. So we'll open to the floor now for comments and questions, um, including from the virtual platforms. We look forward now to your inputs. And we also have our very helpful panelists here who I'm sure will contribute further. So now over to you. Do we have questions? Or do we have questions from the virtual platform as well? Feel free. Anyone else uh, have a question or comment that we could take two or three at a time? <laughs> okay, um, thank you for all the sharing information. Um, I was wondering, for because of one of the workshops we were, like the difficulty to find qualitative um, research and evidence from low-income countries. And something that is a problem for Brazil, for example, is the funding for qualitative research. It's very hard to compete in like funding for um, for research when you're not a clinical trial or you're not in a quantitative way of doing research or when you're doing social and actual science and then you don't have all the results that you want to deliver in the end of the research. So sometimes we receive feedback from the agencies saying, oh, so you're gonna do a particip participatory research and how you're gonna build everything and they get confused and I don't know, but I believe that we need to somehow organize the funding of qualitative research, maybe some special from the Ministry of Health or the agencies to be able to produce this qualitative research, then to be able to use it to inform consent. Okay, thank you. I wonder if we can invite um, John to comment on the finding aspect, because I know this is something you've done a, a lot of work on, then perhaps others involved in, in government uh, that are in the audience or other agencies that fund research may want to comment on the other point. John? John is, is trying to make it easier to find synthesized uh, qualitative evidence. So uh, we've historically focused on finding ones in the health system space, and so there's now about 8,500 systematic reviews about how to strengthen health systems, get the right program services and products to people, and of those 8,500, there, I, I don't know the exact number nowadays, but there's at least 800 systematic reviews that are syntheses of qualitative evidence. And then in the social system space, We've just started a new database, Social Systems Evidence, of which there are now around 3,000 dealing with the non-health SDGs. And again, many of them are qualitative. So there's st probably a lot out there we haven't found, but we're very committed to finding them. So those are two databases where at least you can easily reach in and find the synthesized qualitative evidence. What's more challenging are finding the single studies. Um, and that's something that we need to continue to work on. But some of the innovative approaches like evidence maps, and we've seen some great examples from the Africa Center for Evidence and others are lovely ways of people putting together those single studies so again we can reach in and pull out them, pull them out when we need them. But maybe I'll just, if I have, but when I have the floor, I'll just say a few other things. One is just, Simon, I thought you did a fantastic job of, of laying out an agenda. I was, I was really hoping that over the three days we'd get momentum in a variety of thematic areas and you've distilled it so nicely and I'd love to see us collectively contribute to moving the pieces forward that we feel we can contribute, so thank you for that. Second comment is to say that, um, and I said this in the plenary session, that although we want to chart the future, I think we also have to celebrate successes in the past. And because of you, Simon, and many other people in the room, we've come a long way. 
um, with qualitative evidence. We've got so many novel applications of, of qualitative research methods. We've got an explosion of innovative qualitative synthesis methods. We now have great CERQUAL. We have all kinds of things that weren't there five or 10 years ago. So I think uh, kudos to you and others. People have singled all of you out, Georgie and others, for organizing this event. And I, it feels like a really important milestone, but we shouldn't just celebrate your organizational skills. We should celebrate your contributions to the field, which I think have been very, very significant. Um, and then the, the final comment is just about... <laughs> is just about building bridges. And I think it was Gloria who made the point, which I think is just such a lovely way to uh, position it. We all have kind of partial solutions to complex problems. And I think we need to find ways to speak to one another and really uh, you know, help other people see how we might bring a partial solution, but if you bring this other person in, they'll bring a complementary solution, and another person and they'll bring a complementary solution. And so, um, you know, qualitative evidence, again, is a partial solution to complex problems, and it needs to be nested alongside the data analytics and the trials and the guidelines and the modeling and the evidence-informed policy. All of that needs to kind of come together at the end of the day. The policymakers don't care care about all the individual communities. They want coherent answers to the complex problems they face. And I think we've come a long way with qualitative. And now we need to be really building those bridges exactly as Gloria said. So thanks again. Thanks so much, John. And I think John's challenging us to think about the next steps. Um, so it would be very good to have um, suggestions about how we might move forward in each of these areas, working collaboratively, building bridges, both across disciplines, across sectors. So we welcome comments. And if there, um, the panel here would also have thoughts, um, it would be very good to hear those. Yes. Um, just... Oh. Sorry, uh, just answering your question. Um, I am part of a civil society organization, and actually for our work, there is loads of funding for qualitative research as part of the, the work. So I really do think it's about partnering up in places that sometimes we wouldn't uh, uh, expect <laughs> to have money for qualitative research. And um, also, I think the, the point John makes about uh, the evidence maps, uh, I think it's a powerful tool to speak with governments because you can really see where there's loads of evidence, where are the gaps, and, and advocate for, okay, we have loads of quantitative evidence on that, but no, n not at all qualitative evidence. Or we have qualitative evidence always studying this and this, but not at all looking at this. So I really do think we have to step our game a little up and present to them a, a, a way of saying exactly where funding is needed uh, and why this would improve policy making and, and advancing research. And I, I do believe in this tool of evidence maps as a way of, of really showcasing uh, our, our arguments. I'll just add a little bit onto that, what Laura said. Um, we've seen a lot of really rising spots where qualitative research and evidence is being valued and funded, and that's within Africa. Um, we had a presentation just before from a winning poster that was B, and she's with the South African Medical Research Council. Uh, I think we can also highlight the Kenya Medical Research Institute, and I know we have a representative right here as well. Um, hopefully, Kui will, will join in and add to the conversation. But I was first introduced to them when I was invited to speak at the Social Science Research Council in Kenya, in Nairobi. And they've got a lot of activity going on, and they find their own ways of funding that kind of work. So even though we know that the dominant powers in the North don't necessarily fund work in the South unless they can control it, we're finding the emergence of qualitative research taking place in the global south, and I think that should be acknowledged. Thanks so much. Well, I know it's like 
what time is it now, George? It's ten past five, so we are going down as the 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 hours are going up. And so I just wanted to remind you that we have the virtual platform, and so we can use it to continue to exchange the ideas that we started sharing here through these days, and share whatever it is that we want because it's an open platform. And there's all, there were also a few suggestions that we ran webinars to continue um, the narratives that we built here. So we can make this happen through the virtual platform, capacity building, and we'll use the hope that we planted here to keep on networking and we'll, we'll get there. It's step by step, baby step sometimes, but it's effective. Thank you. Thanks, Shamila. Um, I was wondering if anyone else would like to contribute with suggestions or comments about the next steps. You can also use the survey that we have put on the virtual platform. Um, so if you want to think a little bit more, because it's a lot to digest at this point, you can always return to the virtual platform and elaborate it with a bit more time. And we'll be very happy to have it there because it's, it's ours. Perhaps I could pose a question. So one of the suggestions, as Sharmila mentioned, was that we continue to have some sort of online forum, a discussion list where people can pose questions, share ideas, and keep linked up with one another. Um, is this something that um, people would find useful? Um, I know that we all have a lot of incoming. So um, one more thing can sometimes feel rather overwhelming, and we might regret it the minute we step onto the plane. Um, but um, it might be useful just to get some indication of whether people think that would be a useful thing. Again, it's something we could probably run through the existing platform, um, symposium platform. So we have some nods over here. Um. <laughs> and some high fives over there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So maybe that's something at least we can take forward to continue the conversation and discussions we've had here today. So um, if there are no other comments, um, I would just like to move on to um, one final point, um, which um, Kingsley already alluded to, which is, should we have another gathering of this kind? Um, and to get some feedback on, if we do, should we do it similarly to now? Should we do it differently? Who might host and organize such a meeting? Um, so I'm not sure we're going to reach any conclusions on this, but it would be interesting to get some feedback from people on whether they think this is something that we'd like to repeat in the future. Um, any thoughts? There's someone there. And maybe okay, someone so here. Kerry. Good. No, wait for the mic. Um, not not directly answering um, the question you've just posed, Simon, but I thought if uh, another gathering like this is to happen, you know how you have this, you should the satellite um, sessions that were happening in other places. I think it would be really good if some of those were in the African context, um, because there's you know there's a lot of good work happening there. Ravi, thanks for the shout out. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, if if there could be satellite sessions organized in various African context or maybe even the symposium happening in Africa, that'll be great. Are you volunteering to host Not it? at all. I have to talk to my director first. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have one comment here. Was there one? Here? So we'll first come to Vilia, and um, then I think, um, Aruna, did you have your hand up as well? Oh, okay. So we'll take Vilia and uh, Sudaka and then John, if that's okay. Yeah, my suggestion is actually I find this to be so relevant because I've been looking forward to such kind of a discussion. 
Uh, my answer would be yes. We definitely meet, need to be having such symposium. And in terms of how often to have it, I would suggest if you could be having it like every two years, because having it every year, I think logistically it may be hectic and we may also not focus on other things. So like having it every two years, to me, I feel like it would be important. And then another suggestion which, another su suggestion which I was thinking is, yes, we are going to continue the conversation on qualitative research. But it would be important to include a session where all of us would commit in terms of what we would do next. And in the follow-up symposium, we should have time specifically for reporting progress we've made. In, in that case, it's like we'll, we'll be accountable to what we commit. And also looking at the progress in the two years would be something important. So this is what I wanted to suggest. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, I just want to make a suggestion that uh, in this symposium, uh, what we can say, although there are LMIC people are there, but uh, still there are very small countries where research is not still being uh, like uh, I can say South Sudan or uh, Djibouti and other things. Those are very small countries where qualitative research is not being propagated properly. So we are not getting the feedback from such type of countries and now we should also think of how those countries can be included in this type of things maybe through the capacity building or networking and other things. So this is one of the suggestions I just wanted. And already she said that after two years, we can think of a, a review of the, or organizing this symposium. And also uh, in different continents, we can think of that one every two years. Thanks for those points. And I think you both make an excellent point about um, those are, you know, all of us in different settings need to think about what we can do in our own setting to institutionalize the use of qualitative evidence to take forward these agendas, uh, you know, working with stakeholders and government and elsewhere. So thank you for those suggestions. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's just about, I, I think there's huge value in having the uh, standalone events that are really specifically focused on this issue, but then there's also that power that comes from organizing them alongside other events where you can do the bridge building. And so this is a very diverse group, but from a regional perspective, you know, one example of the hook for an African meeting would be to build it alongside the Africa Evidence Network meeting, which happens every two years and then have a, a day before or a day after. So you have the consolidated opportunity to really dig deep on qualitative evidence issues, but then also the opportunity to build bridges. And there are other meetings, the International Conference on Sustainable Development. Those of us who work in particular fields would go to Health Systems Global. Um, sometimes Cochrane, Campbell, and other evidence synthesis groups get together in the same year in the same venue. So it would be lovely to think about whether we can capitalize on those other events and have a standalone event, but also build bridges. Thanks. Those are great ideas. I think it would allow us to spread geographically as well, which is a constraint because I think we realize, um, and there's been some discussion about this also on the Twitter um, feeds, that uh, there are many people who would have liked to have been here, but the, the cost of travel and the time commitment of travel makes that really hard. And I think having smaller meetings in many different places may help to broaden. Um, our people's access. Um, are there any other comments or suggestions? Yes. Uh, I just think that uh, thinking about us as a network would be really interesting uh, considering all the sets of skills and, and different experiences to maybe build maybe a survey or, or some online form of people, with different teams being able to tell, oh, I have experience in this, 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 and I would really need this and that. 
and maybe for our next symposium we could focus on combining teams with different experience for uh, target workshops and uh, around the, the the year also so i have we, we mapped so many skills and needs and different experiences and i think will be great as a network to better understand where our potential partners might be and uh, strengthen our relationships in the global south also that would be really great thanks lara and i just in that regard wanted to also flag um, the Global Evidence Synthesis Initiative webinar platform and in an earlier discussion with uh, Tamara at the back there who's the coordinator, um, she very kindly volunteered to make that available for things like webinars um, that could happen between now and future meetings online that might allow us to do some of the activities that you've described in a virtual way. So that's something we could explore going forward uh, with Gessie and with other partners um, many of whom are already involved in various webinar programs. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Yes, we have one at the back there from Rita. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, it has been a pleasure to participate and to meet so many amazing um, brains here. Uh, it's uh, it's just an observation. Uh, I think that um, the symposium has been really special in terms of bringing people from different backgrounds. Uh, not all of us in the room and during the symposium were from global health or public health or even health backgrounds. I think this is extremely important. We need to start thinking about health and global health in its you know in its broader uh, broad meaning um, and I really appreciated having historians and social scientists uh, in this symposium I would hope to see more of them uh, and more philosophers as well because I just and maybe uh, uh, people with religious backgrounds or like uh, specialized in I don't know the relations between health and religions because I think all these different aspects are very important in the discussion very important to qualitative evidence uh, and because qualitative evidence has a lot of um, I would say subjectivity in, in, in the analysis and in the synthesis, it's extremely important to have as broad understanding as possible about these issues. I hope that whatever the next steps would be, that we will still have this uh, diversity in backgrounds. Thank you. Thanks. That's a very good reminder. Ah, we have one in front here, thanks. Just to carry on um, with what Rita brought up, um, it felt like the um, language abilities of everyone was something that was really special and having the simultaneous um, interpretation was really integral to being um, very inclusive for many different people. So I would say that's something that was done really well and thanks so much to um, Georgia and Charmilla and um, everyone from FIO Cruz for making that happen and also to reflect on how that could happen again in a future symposium. Oh, it's, it's just something that helped me to organize myself in this symposium because it's new to me. I, I didn't know that we could do what we do as a <laughs> uh, as an evidence. So I would just just like to. Uh, so to do it again, uh, the tasks, the methodology, how you worked, the organization of the symposium with tasks, with um, how to make, uh, what, what you did? I will fly in Portuguese, pode ser, desculpa, gente. Eu tava pensando só é, a forma como foi organizado o simpósium, no sentido das tarefas, e da organização do trabalho, que isso se repetisse. Porque é uma coisa, é, para quem não é muito da área das evidências qualitativas, fazer isso, como é que se faz isso na prática, eu acho que, para mim, ajudou muito. Então, seria no sentido do próximo simpósio, isso também acontecer com 
os workshops e tudo mais, de como é que se faz essas redes e a forma como se organiza isso na prática. Entendeu? É porque foi maravilhoso. Eu agradeço muito. Obrigada. With people running, people who implement these types of research and uh, will be as uh, or acting as evidence brokers and people who are decision makers, the way that we uh, divided the activities uh, within the training workshops and also the parallel sessions that would vary between formats and types and themes. She thought that that was very uh, interesting for her and for new people who are starting to do research, in, well, do research with a qualitative approach to it and who also do these methods. So this is something for us, uh, well, for her, that was very meaningful that she would like to see in all the events. We have more questions or comments. <coughs> so um, I would like to start now with a thanks to everyone who helped us organize this project. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the Scientific Programming Advisory Committee. We have several meetings with them and they were just brilliant to giving us, well, bringing all of you here today. So I would like to thank you all uh, for letting I would like to thank the abstract committee. Um, you were amazing in uh, getting all those submissions that we got, and it were a lot, and summoning it to these wonderful works that we have it uh, through all these three days. So you were really amazing because that was a very difficult task. So thank to you. And then the stipend committee, that was even a harder uh, task that we gave to a few people. Um, we did receive several types of, well, not several, but a few uh, interesting um, funding opportunities. And we had the open uh, registration, but because this is the first and so it wasn't a lot, but we made a lot out of it. So thank you so much for making this happen. <laughs> we would also like to thank the poster assessment team and the open space team. You made this a much more uh, participatory kind of event than we actually had started with. So. Because we designed, it didn't mean that people were going to offer the open space and, you know, your help was much needed. So thank you. <laughs> we would like to also thank all, all our colleagues in Brazil and Norway. Uh, and the participants, the chairs, and the many other people who have helped us in various ways. So thank you to you all. Finally, we would like to thank the Fiocruz team, including the virtual symposium organizing team, the communications team, and all, all of the other symposium staff, because the infrastructure was amazing, and you, you, helped, you made our lives much, much, much easier. So thank you. And I think we should have a very special thanks to Georgie and Sharmila from Frio Cruz for hosting us here and making us feel so welcome in Brasilia for the last few days. So thank you both for your enormous amount of work. We should thank everyone. It's sort of the Brazilian way. We are friendly <laughs> <laughs> and warm. Um, so we would also like to thank the symposium sponsors, so namely the Ministry of Health of Brazil, Fiocruz Brasilia, 
Norwegian Institute of Public Health, TDR, Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, WHO Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office, and the Cochrane. Thank you. Obrigada. And you're all free to go. <laughs>